Here we go. Hello, Kane. How good? Hello, G. Good to be with you both. My biggest winner and loser from the same game. I thought Frio the biggest winner. Yep. Brisbane the biggest loser. Mm. Dogs get off the hook because they've only had one outing. But Brisbane to go over there, four goals up, second half injuries of Frio, all the pressure, all the off-season queries, everything, and they find a way out of it. I thought it was pretty significant. Do you think if this continues, we'll start to draw parallels with um, Geelong and Sydney the previous year? Now, Sydney snuck into the eight, but they were gone with a capital G-O-N-E by round 12. They looked they looked as if they were never going to even threaten the eight and they finally got on a roll, which is, uh, you know, all credit to John Longmire and his group. But it's it's tough coming off that grand final. Well, the, those who won premierships know far better than me, but I, I reckon it's the immeasurable, even if it's just the 2% mentally yeah. that gets you because they're as fit as everyone else. They, but have they got the dog hunger that they had 12 months well, ago is what you can't measure. The, what we've seen from Collingwood, they haven't had it. Yeah, I heard I heard Derm speak about this, and he he summed it up really well. He said, "Look, you can win a one premiership, things go right for you, you get a bit of luck, you win a couple of close games, you have a good run with injury, and it's great. If you win two, there's no luck involved. Yeah, you, everyone's coming after you. You're the hunted. Uh, you won't probably get the luck that you had the previous year. Unlikely you get that two years in a row. You are a truly great side. And I sort of thought, yeah, for someone who's done that, yeah, Derm, and for observing what Geelong and Richmond." And Hawthorne have done well, in the century. The I Brisbane thought, Lions. Yeah, to, the, the Brisbane Lions, are you stopped from winning four in a well, row? They won four. Four in a row. They're up at half time for their four. It's just incredible. Uh, well, even the, I think the Hawks win against the Swans in 2016. They went the top side. Mm. They came from about third or fourth on the ladder that year and uh, just found a way to do it in September. 2014, yeah. It was a, that was a pretty solid one for them. News just to hand. Yeah. This has been coming, but James Harms has been offered the one-week ban for his headbutt on his former teammate, and they are good mates as well, Stephen May. The pair laughed it off at the final siren yesterday, but they had a bit of a running feud going on at the MCG. May even grabbing his face to claim he'd been headbutted after Malcolm Rose has copped the one-week ban for a very similar incident. Why'd that come through late? The Western Bulldogs. Oh, it always comes through about this time. Quarter to six, 20 to six, uh, the day after the game. So... I think those at the Western Bulldogs, once Roses' um, determination being made and they saw the James Hard vision, they had been bracing for the worst. So one week offered to him. Series of fines from yesterday for incidental contact with an umpire stemming from the Port Adelaide West Coast game. Harley Reid fine, Jack Petrotelli fine, uh, Ollie Wines fine as well. The tribunal will sit this week uh, to hear Hawthorne's defence of their skipper, James Sicily, who's challenging the one-match ban for kicking Andy McGrath. Now, I know you had Andy McGrath. I'm not sure if the player code was in full effect this morning, but... It's the medium impact that Hawthorne are going to argue against. Mm. Not the fact that it was intentional or the fact that it was uh, to the body, which are undisputed, but the medium impact is the trigger to get it to one match ban. If they assess it as low impact, then it's just a fine. You're a pretty good chance, don't you think? I think so. I yeah. thought it was, but it, the kick, and oh, when so it's, it's intentional. It's a shocking look, but it still has to be a reportable offence. Well, there used to be such a thing, such as attempted yes, to strike. They did. Mm. And I haven't seen it closely, but I looked out of the corner of my eye at the news only a few minutes ago. And that action deserves a week. Okay. Yeah, I see it differently. Oh, you got I mean, everyone... the table will probably get him off if they can downgrade You've got it. everyone coming after you. <laughs> and he's trying, lash your foot out. Started trying to back up for himself <laughs> and he just like, so softly stuck his foot out. It is the biggest day in the history of Tasmanian football, of course. And we're minutes away from learning the identity, uh, the colours, the name, the logo of the AFL's 19th team. Subject, of course, to the election and perhaps what happens after that next weekend. But it's going to be seismic. We'll obviously be on air when it, when it comes to hand. So we'll keep you up to date with that as soon as we can. Uh, any defence of the ball being in the grandstand of the Port Adelaide West Coast game? The boundary line is just a, a guide, AFL it would appear. The AFL have ticked that off, have they? He was in the Memorial Drive Tennis <laughs> Centre, I reckon, when he oh, when he yeah. set up Petrocelli for that goal. Uh, unbelievable. He got a double squirt of uh, tomato it, honestly, sauce. Honestly, we, we, we can muck around. And I thought the coverage Jared on Fox did a great job of it. Like The, the commentary was spot on. As someone said, I don't know if it was you or the other uh, expert that was with you, the ball's in the, in the stand. And yeah. it was perfectly summed up. If that happened in a grand final, yeah. like there was a, we, there was so we can laugh right about there, it because no one strange. cares because it's West Coast and that game was well, never in doubt. But we should care. When Jeremy Cameron took that mark, we all thought beyond the boundary line at the MCG yeah. at the punt road end. The AFL released a statement at the time, words the effect of the um, complexities with officiating and judging line ball calls on a curved boundary line cannot be underestimated, <laughs> which was basically the angles can be deceiving. But I reckon, words, we got it wrong. But the the. <laughs> Field umpire is in the perfect position, was, yeah. and the boundary umpire, or even though there is two of them, was lagging behind. So why can't the field umpire, who had a clear view and was perfectly positioned, yeah. make the call that the ball's out Particularly of bounds? Particularly now, and we saw this with Kerno on Thursday night, that they've gone to the arc 
for a field umpiring decision. Essentially, that's what's happened. Because the goal umpire Essenti- said essentially. it is a point. The field I don't agree umpire, with that. They went to the arc for a goal umpiring decision. Yeah, they but, did. but in the end, it was overturned as a no score and a field umpiring yeah. decision. Yeah. And and he, ha- he hadn't called holding the ball. I watched well, it. Well, he had no time to call holding the ball because the ball, it was a very curious event, but the ball went over half a second after the incident. So the, how boundary, could he, uh, the goal umpire came charging in. He, he would have had to stop the goal umpire. and so, Yeah, I'm just saying. Yeah. But he would have had to say stop. And you can imagine maybe Razor Ray doing this. Stop. I'm paying holding the ball. Because the, the, the goal umpire still has to get the all clear. We saw it yesterday. If they don't give the all clear, they don't signal anything. Mm. So until you give the goal umpire the all clear, he cannot make a decision. So the Field umpire is in control. Yeah. yeah. I still think they, they got it right and they did it well. Yeah. So that's, in the end, so the right calls made. So that's the discussion here is what we're having with this out of bounds. And yeah. that's sort of the point I was getting to. As long as the right decision is made, we don't care how you got there. So if that means the field umpire can make the call, mm. the field umpire makes, if that means we stop playing, go to the arc, mm. I don't think anyone cares as long as the right decision is made. And we've got four of them out there plus the boundary and goal umpires. Yeah. And in the end, as long as games aren't close, we also don't seem to care. So a 50-point margin over there, it's, it's nothing. If it's a five-point game, mm. then there's all hell breaks loose. Uh, looking forward to getting Hodgie on and get the lay of the land up in Brisbane because the Lions' hopes of a flashy new Gabba home ground have just gone up in smoke today. Initially, in a review steered by the former Brisbane Lord Mayor Graham Quirk, which recommended a new $3.5 billion facility at, at nearby Victoria Park. Then, after that, by Premier Stephen Miles' insistence that the ceremonies will be at Suncorp Stadium and the Athletics out at the Queensland Sport and Athletic Centre out in the Burbs. Now, this is all for the 2032 Olympic and Paralympic Games, of course. Quirk's two-month review claimed the cost of the Gabba rebuild had actually be underestimated to the tune of $700 million by the time they refurbed it, they relocated the AFL, relocated the cricket. Instead, he said, let's build a 55,000-seat uh, stadium at Victoria Park. That's the best outcome for the games in the city. It's got the legacy benefit for Queensland residents yep. covered off as well. $3.7 billion, the original quote exactly. for the Gabba. The new Gabba was one5 Got to 3.7. And now yep. we're up to 3.7 bills. Yep. But That's then Stephen Miles just threw that out the window, Jared, and oh, he insisted he? that Suncorp Stadium will host the ceremonies and the QSAC, the Queensland Sport and Athletic Centre out in Nathan, would be upgraded for the athletics. And that was what IOC Vice President John Coates had suggested. But Quirk's report that came out today said that will be a complete waste of money. It doesn't have the legacy benefit no legacy. after the Olympics. The Premier is ignoring that. He wants to drop $1.6 billion up there. So it's and an, he won't even be in power when the uh, decision is made. Well, that's a whole other debate up there, isn't it? So it's an absolute mess at the moment. Now, I Brisbane, think it's a good result for Brisbane. I mean, it would have been the worst possible scenario had they bulldozed that place well, what and hap- had to find a new home. But now what happens to the Brisbane Lions? Because the Gabba is clearly in danger of being dilapidated. They're not going to get a 55,000-seat uh, stadium, uh, and instead the athletics track's going to be refurbed. Well, they're not going to play out at Nathan. So, so where are the so Brisbane is, Lions is going? nothing going to be at the Gabba? Well, under the Quirks plan, the Gabba was going to be a green space. It was going to be demolished and turned into parkland, and the Lions, I assume, were going to move to the 55,000-seat stadium that was going to be used for the Olympics. Sammy, now I'm not sure what's happening. Sammy happening. Edmund is in the studio for Cobham Estate, giving us the good oil. It is Australia's most awarded extra virgin olive oil grown harvest and first coal pressed in northern Victoria. Let's go to him. Hodgie, where are the Lions going to play? G'day, fellas. Uh, where are the, We don't know. Uh, <laughs> well, I think there's that much going on uh, up here. Well, the, it's safe now they're going to stay at the Gabba. So from, from what everyone got, the, first of all, there was going to be the knockdown, and they said it was going to cost them $2.7 billion, which then they realised that it was going to be closer to $4 billion. Um, the lines are, are, are wrapped that they're not moving anywhere because to move away, where are they going to play? Where are they going to look after their corporates? They're not going to play down at Metricon. Their facility out at Springfield, which is amazing as a training facility, uh, but it's not going to house AFL games. So uh, I think the Lions are pretty happy that they they don't have to move from the Gabba. Is it that bad, the Gabba? Because I was there for the grand final in 2020. It looked pretty good then. Uh, oh, look, as far as facility, it's, it's just old. I think that's where it is. If, I think if you look at the new ones, look what they've done with Adelaide Oval, look what they've done with Optus. Tassie are going to build a brand new stadium. Maybe Tassie are going to build a brand new stadium with a roof. Compare that to... A lot of the new ones, um, it is. It looks dated. They did do a, a few things to it um, during COVID, which were able to update a lot of the corporates and that kind of area. But if you look at that compared to the new ones that are around, you could see why they were pushing for for a brand new facility there. But cost wise, is everything Kane, and they just can't afford it now. Mm. Who was your biggest loser of the weekend? Uh, oh, you, you sort of sit back and you look at the, the, the Owen 2 mob, um, the Pies, and also the Lions um, would have been both disappointed. Uh, I think you mentioned before the Bulldogs, but you probably can't look look past the two grand final sides for them mm. to be 0-2 after 
the pump up. Everyone was saying how how they're going to dominate for the next few years. Lions have been up there for a long time without winning a flag, but you'd sit back and look at the football that both of them played. You'd sit back and go, that geez, they looked a, a touch off it. Hodgie, what is happening with your Lions? Um, well, I'll tell you, it's it's pretty frustrating for anyone who's watching the Lions at this stage. They they can play some of the best football that you see. As we saw Carlton in the first quarter, uh, as we saw in the first 15 minutes against Fremantle, but then it's the lapses. And uh, Jared, you mentioned it just before in your opening that three of their last four games in the prelim final against Carlton, and then the last two games yep. uh, of the first two games of this season, they've given up runs of seven goals. And you sort of sit back and go, "This is when remember how teams used to hold up the signs and mm. they used to put one mm. behind the ball." It seems like they don't have a plan for that anymore because three out of the last four games, one of them was in a final, and then the first two this year. And I think in the grand final, they had runs of two, three goals in a row, which isn't too bad, but it was a low scoring grand final. But I think that's, that's an issue for the coaching staff and the leaders. Cause that's where the leaders on field should be setting, putting in plays, whether you're getting a little bit closer to your opponent, whether you're shutting the game down, where you're taking the momentum away from the opposition ball movement. They've just got a few things that they need to work on. Seem to be a malaise though, Hodgie, as if they'd won the flag and uh, they, you know, they got the early couple of turnover goals early and uh, everything went well for 15 minutes. And then they have lost the ability over in the West, at least to dig in. And when the contested ball started uh, going amazingly Fremantle's way, as in the number of a contested balls, Fremantle was 17th and, uh, 16th, I think, for hardball and loose ball gets last year. And they've turned that around the space of one game. And they were fantastic. And yet there was absolutely no response in the contested ball department. Well, I think it's resilience. I think that's what it comes down to. Yeah, you look at how well they played in the first quarter against Carlton. They yeah. started that game yeah. like a team who lost the grand final. And, and you'd expect that. But when there's this swings with, with momentum in games of football. And you're gonna if you can't score when you've got the momentum, then you're gonna struggle. And if you can if you can't stop your your opponent as the, the Lions can't, you're gonna find it tough to win games. And I think that's the frustrating part. As a leader on the footy field, you should be controlling that. When things aren't going your way, you know that out there. We can feel it watching it, but out in the field you know that. So you've got to put things in place. Whether you you do go to the bench and you call to the coach and say, what can we do? Can we put a seventh down there? Do we go into a tempo style? Do mm. we play skinny side along the boundary line just to get stoppages so they can't get opportunities to score time and time again, as we've seen it in three of the last four games. So what I, what I do know that the Lions will be doing, and Chris Fagan has done that ever since he started uh, at the Lions, is whenever there's a little break, um, an eight-day break or, or a bye, he'll sit down and he'll review the games that they've played. And what he'll do, he'll come up with trends that they've been good at. And if they haven't been great in the, those games prior, he'll look at trends that they've been terrible at and put in a plan to, to hopefully – change that for the next next few games coming up. So at least I know that that's what they'll be doing. But I reckon there'll be a fair few things that he'd want to change after what they've produced the last couple of weeks. You played in uh, plenty of grand finals. You won most of them. You lost a couple. Do you feel as if there's any any hangover? And I know they didn't win, but any hangover just by how high and how hard you had to work. And then all of a sudden you've got, you've got back there and you haven't quite reset your brain. Um, oh no, I think and they, I, I really... say this knowing that they play pretty well in round one. Zero. Yeah, and I think that's a, the frustrating thing for them as well because if you listen to everything that came out, go on to watch them train, they had a lot of people on the track. Yeah. Their their mindset seemed to be spot on. Like they, they took responsibility. The players took responsibility from the grand final. They knew that there was areas that they could have been better at. And by the first quarter, it looked like it was a motivated team. But I think it goes back to you need to dig in when things aren't going your way. And what I've seen in the first two games is when things are going your way and you run in front of the ball and they're winning a the contested possession and getting it out – it looks rosy, mm. and you can score. But then, when things aren't going your way, what are you doing? You, you, who, who's who's put their hand up? Harris Andrews. If it wasn't for Harris Andrews on on Sunday, they yeah. would have lost by fifteen goals. I reckon he was he was exceptional. But I reckon that's the first part of the players we'll have to look at is what do we do when things are going against us? Because all teams have this, but the good teams know how to stop the momentum, and good teams know how to stop the, your opponent from scoring when their back's against the wall. Did they get their media strategy right during the week, Hodgie? Because Lockie Neal came out, he had some strong <laughs> things to say. Essentially, to paraphrase it, he said, we're letting each other down, and they're not going to stand for that. And he was lauded for it. He's like, oh, gee, this is, this is good stuff. From a captain, he's serious, he means business, he's taking accountability, and he's put it on his teammates to be better. Chris Fagan was very sensitive to the follow-up media stories around that. And he's essentially said, well, if you want us to say interesting things, don't dramatise it and beat up the quotes of, of Lockie Neal. And essentially that wasn't Lockie's opinion. That was a group discussion as a team. I don't think he needed to do that. What do you think? 
Uh, I think if you know Chris, he he felt that a few people went at Lockie that he was blaming his teammates, and I think what Chris wanted to do was just Defend him. take yeah take the responsibility back onto the coaches and say this is what we as a collective thought, not so much about Lockie. So it wasn't about a captain pointing fingers at people who didn't have a good game. So I think that's where that's where his mindset was. Did it come across great? Probably not. Um, but uh, to be honest, I love what Lockie came out and, and I think said. We all I, did though. Like I, that I was think, the, that was the, the overriding reaction to it. I thought. Yeah, and that's well, that's what's disappointing that he wasn't out there on Sunday because I reckon the passion that he spoke, how he trains, his mindset, I reckon he would have had something to do with that contested possession when they were, when yeah. they when they were losing it consistently. But that's where you need to do. Good teams will f- find people to step up when their champions aren't playing, and and the Lions had a few on the weekend, but just clearly not enough after the first 15, 20 minutes of play. Does the great Zorko play back flank for the rest of the year after the last quarter? Oh, I hope so. I I'd loved him playing there um, last year. I think it was the start of last year where they where they threw a few people around, but yeah. then they ended up putting him back at half forward. For someone who can break the lines, uh, he's got his speed. His kicking is as good as anyone. I know Kitty Coleman was good with his touch, but Zorko's got penetration. They love him kicking the ball to their forwards. But if you've got someone, especially with Kitty and now Connor out, I, I think it's a must put him back there. So he, yes, he, he might give up two or three goals. Um, as, a, as a defender because he's not used to defending in those positions. But what he can give uh, on the offensive end and, and it will create some of their running because their ball movement on, on Sunday looked shocking. Um, so throw him back there, give an opportunity to create and, and do what he does best and make the game exciting. Mm. What did you notice uh, with the Cats? They just keep finding him. It, <laughs> seriously, you, you look back and go, what they're doing down there is is ridiculous because – all of a sudden, they've got a bloke who didn't play TAC. They, I think they picked him up from Old Carey. Yep. Um, and he comes out as the game winner, kicks three goals in his eighth game in, in Ollie, Ollie Dempsey on on uh, on mm. the weekend. It's You sit back and go, why can't other clubs have the ease of what Geelong are doing? Look where they got Tommy Stewart from. He was playing in the local footy up there, and Scarlo goes, well, why don't you go and give this kid a go? What's he had? Four or five All-Australians playing his... Couple, is he 200th game this week? Yeah, he, or might be, he's might be, he might be five all Australians now, Tom Stewart. Is it? <sighs> Whatever it is, that, that, that kid <laughs> was superb. I mean, his, his, what was going through his ears was computer-like and his ability to make the right decision and kick the blokes in traffic and execute was just scintillating. You've got you've got him, but there's also there's Holmes as well. There's there's Braun. Yep. There's these blokes who, and I know Braun went from a different one, went to GWS and, and came back. But they just continue to to target young kids, and once they give an opportunity, like the, the behind the scenes stuff that um, Mackie and the other guys at Geelong mm. are doing is it's got to be. But they've got to get a pat on their back. Yeah, so been amazing. So I think when they after they won the premiership, and it didn't pay off for them last year, but they brought in youth. So Braun, you mentioned they go and get him. They get Henry from. Collingwood, who's a young player. They go and draft Jai Clark, who's a young player, who's now getting the opportunity. Players like Nevitt, they've still got De Koning. Uh, they got Bose. Got a know. big ruckman. I, I, I don't know if Bose, yeah, Conway. I, I, and he's not playing yet. And as Matty Lloyd said on the Sunday Footy Show yesterday, they're prepared to let them play VFL for a year. Like De Koning plays VFL. Tom Stewart did what Tom Stewart had done. Conway is now developing as a ruckman in the VFL. And they're uh, unique in that way. A lot of other clubs try and get these players in straight away. So the youth is, that they brought in has been important. Is that, is that the old system? Do you know how it used to be? I know that at yes. Hawthorne, this is, this is back in the 80s and 90s, this is, but they used That's to have – like, Michael, Michael, Michael Tuck played 100 VFO <laughs> games and came in and played 300, 400, however many he know. played. Uh. But then – I know, and talking about Hawthorne, we sort of fast-tracked. We gave Buddy, Ruffy and Louie games early on, probably when they weren't ready, but that was the way they were doing it. How long did Geelong Mitchell play? I mean, Mitchell played a lot of AFL footy, didn't he, Sam? Uh, yes, well, Sammy didn't get drafted, and then Sammy had his first – he went and played for VFL – by himself and then got drafted the next year. He was in and out his first. So he probably played a year and a half, two years of VFL consistent before he got mm. into the, the Hawthorne senior side. Mm. But it looks like Geelong have turned back the clock and went back the old way where it's learn the system, learn the structure, learn how to play football, and then you can come into the seniors where <laughs> with what Geelong have been able to do the last the last 15 years, yeah, who's to say it's not the right way? And both Sydney teams you want to highlight. They're, they're in pretty good shape. Well, if you look at the... Both that they've who they've played. Obviously, they both played Collingwood so far. Uh, Sydney played Melbourne in the in round one, but just they, they both look classy. They both look stylish, um, and they, they've changed their tack both both weeks. I think GWS was so smart the way they played Collingwood. It was all about short kicking. They they don't want to kick the ball long to it to a fifty fifty, and when they do, they're good at it. But their whole their whole mindset with the ball is pierce their way through the zone. 
Um, don't take risky op- uh, options. And then last week against North Melbourne, they obviously ran it out with handball. Um, you look at Melbourne, uh, Melbourne and Sydney in that first round. Sydney just beat them up physically around the contest. Grundy was amazing. Heaney was good. And then you watch what they did last weekend. Um, so you sort of sit back and they just outclass Collingwood, a, a team that you come off the premiership. And the way they moved the ball, the, how smart they were not to go back at Collingwood. When they turned the ball over, they were able to go wide. They used Gordon out wide. I think he had 30. A lot of them were uncontested. I think 26 of the 30 were uncontested. I just like the way it's Sydney going about both both the Sydney sides are thinking about their football and they're ex- more, more importantly, they're executing their game plan. Mm. Watching at the MCG, it was just unbelievable how much more work Collingwood, sorry, Sydney were doing than Collingwood. They were getting 18 defenders down there before Collingwood could move the ball. I just wonder if you can keep that level of output going mm. for such a long season. I mean, clearly there can be a couple of downsides as they uh, unveil down in Tasmania the Devils and we're uh, getting our first look at, at the, the mascot. At the mascot. You like it, Jared? I don't mind oh, it. Yeah, I like it. It doesn't look anything like the uh, the one on uh, the Disney program. It no. looks a little bit more ferocious than that. But, what uh, you can't quite see there is the colours that they revealed first right. by Matthew Richardson. Myrtle green, primrose yellow and rose red. So they're the three colours. Okay. They are the Tassie Devils. We're Myrtle. Tasmania Devils. Yep. We, can, we, can approve, we can approve of that. And then the logo as well. It's going to be hard to describe on the wireless. It's just been uh, had the curtain pulled back on it down at Rosalind How Park much in Hobart. Carnage, Sammy, and, and Hodgie as well, you can chip in, will be done to teams' lists. How pillaged will they be? Oh, significant. And when, when will that start? Like, when will clubs start to have to get nervous about a Riley Sanders or about a well, Tom, they're already or a planning. Tom Green? No, or... Clubs are already planning for this now without knowing the full ramifications of when what... When you say carnage, there's only half a dozen Tasmanians though, isn't there? No, but, that, but it might not No, but it'd be, be more be the draft concessions, yeah. the list concessions, yeah, okay. so the access to the talent in the first place. It has to be, and I think like it has Gary to be Ablett's significant. Gary not from the Gold Coast, but he still went up there for a big check. There's they will have, a few of those. And they'll have plenty of checks to throw around as well, so the temptation will be there. So, yeah, that's all ahead of us, of course. Um, let's just get the the stadium built down there first and worry about it. But to answer your question, VFL a couple of years out, Brendan Gale, it sounds like he's almost a certainty to happen now as the inaugural mm. CEO. He clearly knows what he's doing. Um, and they'll be armed. They'll be armed. And I reckon they'll mm. prove to be dangerous as well in the lead up. Just to follow up, Hodgie, on, on Jared's point there about game style before we um, had the announcement there of Tassie, how much, and I think you've been big on this in the past, do good teams need to manage the season? Like, I, I look at Port Adelaide, for example, and Charlie Dixon yesterday. At some point, he's going to get injured unless they manage him and they manage his year. And well, not beauty get, is they got Ollie Lord to come in, hopefully, yeah. when he gets over half it. Half and half he's half a ripper. George Yardis as well. Mm. But yeah. that level and getting to that level, Hodgie, about you know some bit of short-term pain through the season to make sure you're peaking in September. But I think that's why it's so important to start the season. If you look what Geelong were able to do uh, in, two, in 22, yep. their yep. premiership year, is they were able to pick and choose – when they rested Selwood, when they rested Danger, if they weren't up, when Hawke had a rest. So being up the top in the top four and the top two gives that flexibility for teams where if you if you get off to a bad start, as Brisbane have done, as Collingwood have done, that puts pressure on that you need your best players playing towards the end of the year to catch up those games that you lost. So being fit and ready at the, at the right time of the year is, is crucial. Look at Port Adelaide. They went out in straight sets. Melbourne mm. went out in straight mm. sets last year. It just goes to show that if you can get the wins on the board early – the coaches, if you if you do have the luxury late in the season where you might be playing a North Melbourne or a West Coast, that they're the games, that, or they're the games you're probably looking to, to rest those players. Mm. Do you think on Sydney, um, Taylor Adams is in their best side? It's a question. Uh, well, take away the first two games, I would have said yes because what Sydney Sydney was so good with what they've done. So you, if you look at how they've built from the 2022 Grand Final where they were playing as exciting football as anyone, Geelong smashed them that day. Last year, they got injuries in the first half of the year to everyone over six foot two, six foot three. They were depleted all their tools. When they got everyone back, they were flying. They were charging into the finals until they ran into a flying Carlton team. That's the only thing that, that set them back. Um, so what did they do? They, they looked at where they're good, where, where they need improvement. It was contested footy. So they mm. went and got Grundy and Adams. So mm. I would have sat and back Jordan. and said 100%. Yeah, and, and Jordan, yeah. But I would have said 100%. Adams is in there. Grundy's in there. And that's where they're going to get their grunt from. But then you look at what they've been able to do with Isaac Heaney. It's like they've got this gem sitting there that we, we know John Longmire loves him as a forward because half forward is the hardest place to play on the field because you get bypass, you've got a defender right up your backside. 
he can kick two or three goals a game. That's why John loves him there. But then when you see what he was able to do, especially against Melbourne, 13 clearances, and then on the weekend, break lines, he's fit, he's smart, he's able to push forward and kick a couple goals. It sort of throws the question as, well, if Adams is in great form, he'll be getting a game. But if, if he can't find the footy, then they know they've got flexibility in a Parker, a Mills, a Heaney, and an Adams yeah. that, that can all go through that have that bigger body. Can I ask you a question, Joe? How do you rate Rowbottom? Because we never, like, Hodgie's just rattled off all the Sydney mids, and no, no one ever mentions Rowbottom. But I, he's, I've in, watched, my, he's in my favourite uh, players. Up he, there. He, I thought he would be, because yeah, I've he's watched this guy, and he, like, he's 17 touches a game, right? Yeah. So he's not, and he's not a goal kicker, he's not flashy, but he'll give you 10 tackles a week, and they're good yeah. tackles. He's, uh, he's been a fantastic player. I think he's come third in the best and fairest two years in a row. They must love him. Well, well how could you not? Yeah. I mean, he, he, he nails blokes. I mean, his tackle on Dugowie was just unbelievable, mm. sublime. But he, he fronts up every week. He doesn't have a bad game. Mm. He has he has that same game 22 weeks of the year. He doesn't fluctuate. He's never best on the ground, but he's never out of the top five or mm. six. What happens to Taylor Adams, who was who left Collingwood in part to prolong his career because he'd been squeezed out of that midfield? Mm. Is there a possibility he's been squeezed out of the Sydney midfield before he's even played a game? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's 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 a good position to be in if you're John Longmire. Oof. But at some stage, they're going to ask themselves, are we better with Heaney in a forward pocket for 15 minutes a quarter? I mean, Parker's going to be looking for that same spot. Probably not in Sydney starting midfield now, so he's going to he mm. can jump and take a mark, a mark in the forward. And Mills line. is Mills is though. Well, Mills can go onto the half back flank. Yep. I mean, at the present time on the half back flank, you've got notionally Harry Cunningham or you've got uh, Young Roberts who's played well. But if it's Roberts Lauren. or Mills, mm. you've got you've got uh, Ollie Florin who's in good form. Lloyd's, Lloyd's up on the wing. Uh, McInerney, who probably had his nearly had his best yeah. game for the Swans on the weekend, he's sort of par forward a wing. So we've got Chad Warner. We haven't touched on either. Well, yeah. we've got Chad, but I mean Chad's not going out. <laughs> Chad's uh, he's 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 <laughs> aiming up. I'm, I'm just looking at more of the of the uh, workmen in and around where Adams is. You know, they can shuffle the team around and slide Adams in. I hope it just doesn't get to round six and he thinks. If I got buyer's remorse here, would I have been better suited yeah. somewhere else? No, there might there might be a bit of that because Mills and a row bottom, which is where I was going, and Adams, I'm not sure they all fit in the, mm. the same line. Mm. How worried should we be about the pies, Hodgie? Um, it's it's only two games. Look, we we, we know that they can. Oh, we hope that they can flick a switch. I know a lot of the Collingwood supporters are, but what what's got me is didn't it, have they changed their game style to be a little bit more aggressive? Didn't we've always thought Collingwood has been this aggressive ball movement team and. They, they pull off kicks. They burst from stoppages. Nick Dacos is that exciting. So is his brother. We've got the go in there. Um, they've, they've, it seems like whether it's been from the way that uh, GWS and then Sydney have, have defended them, it seems like they've gone through the corridor a little, a little bit more. Last year, they were number 18th. They used to go around the boundary out of the defensive 50 more than anyone else. They, they wouldn't take risks. Once they got it outside D50, and then they'll try and go through the middle where – They've changed and they've started to hit up through the middle in the first two games. But unfortunately for them, they've turned the ball over and given up 35, 40 points from turnovers while they're going through the middle. So has that been a little tweak that they've tried to make just to stay ahead of the game, which has come back to, to bite them on the bum? Mm. I saw the champion data numbers in the first week and Hoyne said, don't panic. But I've never seen the numbers and my, what my eyes told me have a greater disparity because my eyes told me on the first week, they were going pretty, you know, they're going okay, but they weren't manic, and no. they came up against the manic Giants. And then, but Champion Data suggested that if they played that game yeah, 10 times, they'd win score. seven. Well, the expected score had them in front, and that's yeah. why I said the disparity between what your eyes were telling you, they weren't manic, and they certainly weren't manic on the weekend. And, uh, you know, they got some holes in the defence. They've got a couple of kids playing back down there, which aren't, uh, well, it's not Nathan Murphy, and they've been missing him, no. as been discussed a few times. So how so, big's Thursday, Jared, against the Saints, well, who are huge. not easy to play no, against? because it's, Bris it's Brisbane after that. Yeah. I mean, it's a must win for them, Hodgie, obviously. You don't want to go three, love, and then be facing Brisbane in round four. I think that's yeah, Gabba, too. Is, I think he's St Kilda, because they want to run and create, and yep. is that going to play into, into Collingwood's hands? Because Collingwood want you to blaze away, and that's what Sydney and GDS wouldn't give them. Sydney were number one for short kicks against them. Mm. Great tactic, and they, they'd only kick long if they had to. And then Sydney on the weekend would go around them. So Collingwood, the difference with Collingwood was last year, they they were pressuring. They were in the top five for pressure 
whenever they put some, the team would get the ball in the middle, they would be you can, you can picture it now. All the Collingwood halfbackers, all the mids squeezing in, putting frontal pressure on, yeah. turning the ball over, keep it in their forward fifty. What's happening now is that ball is now going around them. So Sydney on the weekend were excellent. They didn't want to handball through Collingwood's numbers. They would go around out to Gould, and that's why there was three or four times where McDonald got an easy Joe Goose mm. in the goal square because Collingwood are still trying to squeeze up. But opposition teams in the first two weeks in the Giants and Sydney, they're not trying to go through them like teams did last year. They've been more composed either by short kick or by Sydney that would go around out to the wings and, and push down that way. Mm. Teams who don't give Collingwood what they want have been successful, but that's where they are St Kilda skilled enough and disciplined enough to do the same against Collingwood this week. You're an expert on the MRO, Hodgie. Should Sicily <laughs> have been suspended? Uh, I don't think so. I reckon give him a fine and say that's just silly. He uh, he came. McGraw ran at him and he's dipped low. I think he's tried to trip him rather than kick him. Um, and people are going to say, oh, you're biased. It's all hard. That's not a kick. And if it was, he hardly touched him. Uh, McGrath even said afterwards, he, he didn't even mm. realise that he kicked him. So I think that's enough for, for him to get I'm off. I'm with you. I'm with you. Jared's not. Sammy sort of shaking. He said, you've got the deciding vote. I think you? it's down. I think he kicked him. It's just down to the force, well, which we can it. debate so until. So should he be suspended and, or not? I think it's low impact. So I think he should be so a fine. A fine. Right. Yep. What about Redmond? Yeah. Um, they, they've they got no – they can't get out of that. That's something you just have to take because he was – and especially from how Laura said yesterday, the push against Lockie Neal, uh, against yeah, Hewitt, from Hewitt, Hewitt, said yeah. in play, that's where it's classified. It can't be intentional because it was in play. It's the ones that they're off play and you get someone – uh, in in the face, and that's exactly what he did. So they've got no leg to stand on. That, that explanation – has no relativity to common sense. So, I mean, what's it got to do it with it's in play or not? You you throw a punch whether you're in play or out of play, it's a punch. Yeah, yeah. I, th- I think what they what they were trying to clean up is if there's so much going on with blocks and bumps and yeah, pushes. I understand that. that, that off the but shoulder, don't off, don't fix that up and stuff up the reality of what's going on in time. <laughs> Yeah, that just makes no sense. I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to explain what their mindset is. <laughs> yeah, no, don't go off at me. Mate. I'm, I'm happy that they're speaking and they're speaking more and they're trying to explain things, but their explanation. Yeah. Well, made I understand the explanation. No, sense. Made, oh, no we talk, it yeah. made no sense. I'm with you, 100. Yeah. So, it was so with, the, with the with one, they can't argue it because the, the the example the AFL gave. If you're away from the ball, out yeah. of play, and you get someone high, it's classified as an intentional, whether you mean it or not. Yeah. And that's a simple one. That's why they can't argue. The Sicily one, they have to argue because of the force. This one, they've got no grounds to argue on because it was off ball and he got him high and it was pretty forceful. Can you ask me, can you tell me, and I, I, I suspect it was Brad Scott, send his charges out there, let's get stuck into this bloke, Let, let's make him lose the plot. He lost the plot. He, he, he kicked the guy or he, he attempted to kick a guy. Now, whether it's force or not, he still had the lack of discipline to throw a leg out, which is crazy and stuff. Not only that, he didn't touch the footy. And he had goal, right. and he had goals yeah. kicked. He got on badly him. So now, now a Hodgie, and and I'm not sure you were ever in this position, but teammates of yours would have been. There's definitely a target on your back. Say so it's a bit like Gorn. Like I was critical of the Bulldogs because they didn't go after Gorn. How could you not after what happened to him in round one against Sydney and what Port Adelaide have done to him? Bulldogs didn't lay a glove on him. Now Sicily should surely expect that attention more often. Without a doubt, as soon as you crack it, become undisciplined and. Obviously, are they th- sitting there thinking it was Guilfi's positioning on him that didn't give him the ball? Or is it the fact that he was that fired up because he gave a free kick away that he he couldn't concentrate on playing his role? Teams are going to continue to target him because of that. And whether e- either way, they're going to be getting someone to play a defensive forward role on him. And they're going to be, ev- every time someone runs past, they're going to be hitting him just to try and see if they can get a reaction. For one, they know the umpires are looking at him because mm. a lot of stuff that Sicily does, he stands out and he argues with the umpires. So they'll... They're, they're sitting there waiting just to do a reversal or to, to give another free kick against him. Done good coaching by Brad Scott. I mean, if you're going to line someone up, I don't think many people would come up with Guelphie. Mm. But Guelphie, yeah. small forward, who kicked a couple of goals, he was terrific. Hodgie, some of the recruits have, have caught your eye. When I say recruits, those that have changed clubs, and there were plenty of those during the trade and free agency period. Yeah, Ben Mackay. I thought uh, he was spoken a lot last year with the trade of where he was going. I know Hawthorne were, were chasing him, um, being out of contract at North Melbourne. Sydney. Uh, and Sydney, yes, Sydney are also going yep. after, but tell you what, the the first game that he played for Essendon on Saturday against the Hawks, mm-hmm. he was he was outstanding. When Hawthorne were chasing him in that first half, there was four or five instances where Hawthorne kicked it in and he either took the intercept mark or spoiled or had some form of impact. He died out late in the game, but that was because the ball wasn't really reaching their forward fifty defensive fifty much. But I thought uh, I thought his first game up showed um, why Brad Scott went after him. He, he's seen a lot of him, even though that was only his ninth win in about ninety odd games that he's played. Um, but yeah, I tell you what, he was he was a great pickup. And the other one was it uh, for the other team is Ginnivan. Jack Ginnivan, who 
The Essendon supporters remembered him as if he'd played for Collingwood. They <laughs> booed him as soon as he picked the ball up. Yep. But he had nine touches in the first quarter, mm. started really well, had a nice little left foot snap, and he kicked two, two of the better goals on the day. So I thought for a couple of guys, and even Goldstein, um, he, he had a nice impact. He's got the number one Ruckman there in front of Draper. Um, yeah, so I thought both teams with their recruits actually stood up and played some okay footy. Can you remember the incident where he was tackled high? The umpire said you shrugged your shoulders. <laughs> I, I reckon he's stiff. I think he's been characterised. And uh, whilst I think he was entitled to do what he did and it should have been paid a free kick. Yeah. yeah and that's what that, In fairness to the umpire, um, when you've done it that much, it gets spoken about. Yeah. yeah, that's what you are looking for. We talk about Sicily and a team's going to target. That's yeah. what umpires are looking for him to do something silly to give away a free kick. Umpires are going to look at Jack Ginevan to sort of say, is he ducking or is he trying to initiate the contact high? And and when, when it comes to that, sometimes you're going to miss him. He has got a lot of free kicks from it, but the umpires are definitely aware of the trick that he that he does try. And you're right, it was about 30 metres out from where I was. It looked yeah. like he initiated it. Um, but as you said, he may he may have got a bit high, but you're going to get some of those. Yeah, I think the umpires are trying to uh, square up the ledger. <laughs> Jack Billings is another one coming through off the text as well. Who's good for the D's. Brody good. Grundy's obviously started the season well. Port Adelaide have got a few in the door. Soldo and Radigalia. So well, look, Big Ivan was. Yeah, he was good. The numbers were good. Kick straight. You couldn't you couldn't doubt or question the the two defenders. They were both excellent. And he's not and a think, new. Yeah, Hodgie. No, I was going to say, and I think that's this is why it's so good the trade period. And this is why I. I'm a big fan for the mid-season trade. Yeah. Um, it, it, you've got certain players that aren't getting a game for teams just sitting back, and this is the prime of their career. Give them an opportunity. That's why I love where they go somewhere and they stand up and really – and this is why I'm hoping for Adams is the same. He, he sort of got pushed out of the Collingwood team. I hope that he gets his chance up in Sydney like these other guys we've just mentioned have. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a good point. And uh, just one of the guys who changed clubs, he changed uh, – he's changed uh, – so I almost changed countries, was Oscar McDonald, who yeah. unfortunately went down. Has there been any no, and update I checked, on them? tried to check with Fremantle just before we came to air. They're clearly fearing the worst, but non-committal at this stage. So former Demon, former Blue, worked so hard yeah. for a third chance. Uh, Plus William Cox Stanley going down in the same game. It was a big blow to them. Yeah, and the Brennan Cox one looked significant, didn't yeah. it, with that hamstring? It's it just three months, though, I reckon. Some heartbreakers over the weekend, Hodgie. Gibkiss, obviously, and Oscar McDonald bookending it with very similar landing mechanisms, yeah. that horrible hyperextension of the, of the peg. Yeah, I think that's that's the hardest part this time of year. You have players that go through pre-seasons. You look at Prestia, another one, who he's had – his body's let him down so many times over the years, so he finally has a good pre-season, comes back, and early in the game does that hamstring again, and mm. he's going to be out for a, for a period of time. That's uh, four to five weeks, I think, that one. Yeah, it'd have to be. I, I meant to ask Kane, who wanted to sack 12 Richmond players after round zero, <laughs> whether or not he'd given them a reprieve. Because Gee, they, be, they deserve one. Absolutely. They were fantastic on uh, Thursday night. And unfortunately for Prestia and Richmond, had he played, they probably would. They, they were significantly stiff around the ball. Yeah. And, and Toby Nankervis made a monumental difference to that side. Two on the bench yeah. for a half. Yeah. Five-day break coming back from a hot Queensland. I thought that was a mighty effort. At the MCG. Yeah, not to be not to be taken lightly, the Tigers. They're going to knock off a lot of clubs. Clayton but, Oliver's, yeah. Who have they got this week? They should... Uh, You've got me on the hop there. Sorry. Question without notice. I'll get yeah, it at the AFL. Port Adelaide it is. Oh, that's, that's going to be a tough game for both of them. It is indeed. Clayton Oliver's not a new recruit, but in many ways, given most people thought he was going to face a delayed start to the season, to have him right off the bat... He almost feels like one for Melbourne, mm. and to think that uh, for all the training he's done offside, all the time he spent away from the club, he looks as fit as anyone running around at the moment, Hodgie. This was uh, his coach, Simon Goodwin, on the influence of Clayton Oliver so early in Melbourne season. So serious was it for a time that this was, you know, football's equivalent of an intervention order, so bad had it gotten. Now, there have been a few hiccups since then, but by and large, he's brought back in. Mm. They always wanted to get him in. They never wanted to trade him unless he made it impossible for Melbourne to keep him. So this is what Melbourne had always hoped for, but I think even for the most glass half full employee at Melbourne, it's it's exceeded expectations. Well, he's such a fantastic player, and uh, Melbourne arguably don't win the game if he's not playing because his second half was uh, quite yeah. scintillating. He's, uh, I mean, we, we know how good a player is. Would have been one of the great footy tragedies had he been lost to Melbourne and uh, and lost to footy. Oh, gee, I was frustrated with Tim English's game. And I'm a big fan of Tim around the ground as a ruckman, and generally he's not a bad tap ruckman. He's he's going to get better, and you know he's still basically a baby in that area. But he didn't try and change his angles. He was around a boundary throw, and Max is always in the front spot and holding him out with his arm. And it just frustrated me that uh, he didn't actually take it upon himself to to get the Rubik's cube out and look for another solution. 
Yeah, well, let's be honest. We knew what Max Gorn was going to come out and do after what Grundy did to him the week prior up in Sydney. Uh, but you're right. You saw how Grundy competed against Max Gorn last week. He'd go across the line. He'd take his ground. He wouldn't let Max use his height and his reach. Um, one thing against Max, you have to come up with three or four different tactics on how yeah. to beat him because how he was going to respond, you knew he was going to be back to the max of old, be aggressive with that. I'm surprised that they didn't target him. Uh, yeah. If you look at the yep. success that uh, that Sydney had, and it doesn't have to be dirty, it's just got to make sure Max knows if you're going to play 90% as a ruckman, we're going to make it as un- uncomfortable and, and as physical for you as we possibly can. But with English, you need to be smart on that. If your one wood isn't working, you need to have two or three other options to go against. If you look at Max, he had 35 hitouts, had 26 touches, had uh, had eight clearances, had one um, handball. <laughs> which is surprising. <laughs> we know Ruckman should be handballing more than that. But um, but that's I mean. we, we knew Max was going to come back uh, the way he did. But from the Bulldogs' point of view, you've you got to make things harder for him. I was talking to Angry from Armadale, very upset about Melbourne last week. He's, yeah. he's much happier this week. He would be. We, we, just, just, just with the goodie, um, with he, what he mentioned after the game, the, the words that he chose, I reckon he deliberately used them. There was connection, committed happy and healthy, all mm. in that short little 20-second yep. grab that we played. He wants to let everyone know about how much he has changed. Uh, and if you've, and it's, it's not as if he was a selfish player, but he was, he was told that he needs to invest more in the people around him. And I've, I've, I spoke to staff members up in Sydney last week, and they said they've noticed a difference. He's walked in, he's happy, uh, he's talking to blokes, he's interested in what they're doing. Um, and it's not to say that he was, he would just ignored everyone, but they said it's been a noticeable change in, in the last six, seven weeks. That's why they trusted him to put him back in. Are we surprised that he went and had 35 touches? No, because that's what he does. Are we surprised how fit he is after being away from the club? Well, that comes down to his professionalism. And that's where it went, goes back to committed. As Goody said, he's committed away from the footy field, which means he is in better shape. And after missing a patch, he can go and produce what he did because of him looking, him, he, him looking after himself away from the footy club. 0433 98 11 16 is the number if you want to reach us off the 40 Winks temper text. Ian in Viewbank has done that. Coming back to your recruits, Hodgie, uh, Ian wanted to give a shout out to Massimo D'Ambrosio who's joined the Hawks. 29 possessions, I think it was, at the weekend and their leading possession winner. He had an influence as well. He was great. Just just nice ball use. I think that's what we need. Uh, just a, a small... He's not small. He can, he can run and create, but just that left foot, that timing, the touch that he's got, that, which probably Hawthorne have lacked a little bit since since Virgil left. Yeah. Matt in Jembrook posed this question. I don't think Kane read this out earlier. This is one for for you two gentlemen. Boys, I know Paddy Dangerfield absolutely flushed that kick, but did he make the right decision? Should he have taken his 30 seconds and then kicked to a teammate for an uncontested mark? Now, Matt in Jembrook is saying if he misses that goal, the Saints could have gone coast to coast and won. I'm not sure what Champion Data say about the Saints going coast to coast from a kick in <laughs> and kicking a goal. I don't think it happens too often, but does Matt uh, carry some weight with that query? Hodge? Hodgey? How much? How long was left on the clock? Would have been a minute or yep, so. A minute, I think, when he kicked the goal. <laughs> It's 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 got merit. It's got yeah. merit if you've got someone there who you can pass it short to someone else. But it's it's like anything. You live and die by the sword. Yep. Paddy's go back. Paddy's a person who backs himself. Paddy's a person who knows that he can. He's got the distance yep. in him. Um, so it all, it's ultimately up to the person with the football. Yep. If, if you, you if you a lot of players would be sit back going, can I take another thirty seconds and pass it shorter to someone else who can have the shot? So it's actually it's actually a decent question. But if you know if you know Paddy Dangerfield, he's always going to back himself to make that distance. Just on the Fremantle game, what upside do you see for them? Uh, well, the, and take, the take into consideration they've just lost a few players. Yeah, the, the, res, well, that's, the, the resilience of getting jumped early, like getting four goals down in the first 15 minutes. I'm sitting here going, this could be 100 point. They've just signed the coach for a year. This could backfire big time. But they responded. They got two goals late in the first quarter, later in the first quarter to get back. It was about 13, 14 points at quarter time. But then just their competitiveness around the football. Sarong is an absolute star. Could we put? Could the Lions put someone on him a bit earlier? Mm. Jared Berry, you just go and sit on him. As soon as he had fourteen in the first quarter, Berry shut him down because he's the person who is going to be giving him the given the the source to the rest of the people around there. And then later on, when they started blokes dropping uh, and they didn't drop their intensity, uh, you sort of sit back. It's going to hurt him there because yep. having two or three of your talls go down. But they would walk away from that with knowing that they've got the confidence to bounce back, the resilience to run out of game, and also the, the strength in and around the stoppage where they, they dominated. And Suns, Suns and, sorry, more, more importantly, Adelaide, who really, I think, have escaped scrutiny on this side of the country, probably getting a little bit of a focus over in Adelaide. And uh, feel free, folks, to give us a call and give us your thoughts. But, I mean, they were horrible early in the piece, and the, the Suns were pretty... Pretty hard at it and uh, and did well to hold on and, and get the points. 
But it's not an easy go- place to go to, the Suns. I, I always found it difficult to, you know, turn up. It's 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 almost half country, half <laughs> half uh, city metropolitan. It's still got that Gold Coast flavour to it. It does. And it, look, the teams hate – I spoke to Joel Selwood last week. He goes, teams hated going up to Gold Coast to play in the first few rounds of the year because it's so slippery, the conditions. Yep. And Gold Coast is so good with their hands, whether it's because they're training all through summer with the humidity. Whenever it's a damp – ball, whether it's through rain or, or the sweat. Uh, if you look at them, they don't lose up at Darwin for, for similar reasons. Joel said he hated coming up here early in the year because of how good and how hard Gold Coast are to play. Um, and it was the same. It was a wet, slippery conditions where Adelaide switched on at the start. It's, it's hard to say. They definitely dominated late, kicking majority of their score in the last quarter. I'm, I'm still not against Adelaide. I reckon they've still got so much upside, uh, yep. upside from there. But what I, what I am worried about is their, their away home Record yeah. compared to their away. They're, since the start of last year, they're nine and four at home, and two and nine when they play away. Mm. They're two wins away from Adelaide Oval. They've been against the Hawks down at Tassie, and against West Coast. And everyone's beaten West Coast over there when when I think Tex kicked ten uh, in the last game last year. So that's the that's the concerning thing for Adelaide. But I'm not going to take too much away from them considering how the conditions were. They're back this week against Geelong on Friday night, and they'll be um they'll, I reckon they'll challenge. Just quickly Geelong. speaking of Tex, so you raised just before we break, would they be regretting that decision, Adelaide, to not fly him? Now it wasn't a night for key forwards, it's no, fair it to wasn't. say, but they've already locked him in for the Cats. So it was clearly and they've been pretty open about the fact if the game was at the Adelaide Oval, he wouldn't have played, and the the hour or two on the plane was the thing that brought him. Up. Would they regret that when you when it's fine margins for the for the top eight? Absolutely, Kane and I were talking about this on Thursday night. That I mean, if it's a, if it's just a little bit of a back spasm, and he would have played if it was at home, well, fly him up the day before mm. and just uh, yeah. make a it's decision on the day. It's it's to hot tell our trip. Gold Coast. You go to the beach for yeah. a bit of a recovery in the morning. Yeah. I reckon that they'll be regretting not playing him. If he physically, if he wasn't right to play, hundred percent. But if they're saying he, if it was a home game and yeah. just because of a flight, put him in business class. I'm sure Tex would hate that. A <laughs> night away from the kids and go and go for a walk on the beach in the morning. I reckon he would reassess his decision again.